The Man Whore Podcast is sponsored by HotMovies.com. Try out some ethical, paid-for porn for free with none of those hidden fees or secret subscriptions when you sign up at HotMovies.com and use the promo code MANHORE. Squirting. It's awesome, it's hot, but it can be messy. If you're a squirter, or have a partner who squirts, or you're one of those magicians who can make any vulva that comes your way gush like Niagara Falls, then you need to know about Mombe Blankets. This is one of my favorite accidental sex accessory stories. Mombe makes waterproof blankets that are not only practical, but are stylish and crazy soft. What they didn't realize is that they made the perfect blanket for female ejaculators. They come in different sizes for any bed and a variety of colors that are sure to match the decor of your fuck palace. How'd I find out about Mombay Blankets? A partner of mine is a massive squirter. It's wonderful. Uh, But what wasn't wonderful was the mess it would make. You can fuck on top of towels, sure, but those aren't very comfortable. They scratch up your behind, right? This woman brought over a Mombay Blanket and I was so blown away. I just had to get you all a special deal. Mombe is going to give away a free blanket to one of my lucky listeners. Follow me on Instagram at BillyIsPresida to be automatically entered to win. I'll announce the winner on May 1st. For the rest of you, get 15% off a Mombe blanket when you visit MombeBlankets.com. That's Mombe, M-A-M-B-E, Blankets.com. Promo code MANHORE. Now let's get to the show. Welcome to the MANHORE Podcast. Shout out to all the glory holers and squirt drinkers, romance junkies and hunky monkeys. This is Billy Presida and you are listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Hunky monkey. Uh, Honestly, that felt very uncomfortable to say. And I did check uh, Urban Dictionary to make sure that was not a slur. It is not. But I was nervous when I wrote it down. I was just doing word association. Hey, everybody. That's a weird way to say happy five-year pod anniversary to me. Yes, um, I I am recording this on April sixteenth, which is which marks five years of the Man Horror Podcast. Holy shit! Uh, I am I'm so excited. I, uh, I I don't think I yeah I don't think if you had asked me five years ago if I would still be doing this in 2019. But then again, if you had told me Donald Trump would be president in 2019, I'd also tell you that you're high. So who knows? This week, we've got porn star Riley Ray's. And I cannot wait to share her with y'all in a bit. But first, get them hot. Get them dates. Show dates. For all you New York people, April 29th, I'm going to be at Pete's Candy Store. Okay, follow me on social media for the time on that. I'm still waiting, but you know what date matters the most. August 2nd through August 4th, Man Whore Con. Oh, yeah. Uh, just this morning, another person bought a weekend pass for what is like the th- third, fourth, let's be conservative, the fourth coolest weekend in the world. In the country, definitely at least in New York City. Uh, yes, Man Whore Con is my annual fan whore meetup uh, where we all gather in New York City and hang out doing a bunch of really fun, awesome, sex positive social events. And you can still get a discounted weekend pass. You can have a whole weekend of fun hanging out with me and listeners just like you for just $75. Honestly, how am I making money? Eh, I'll figure it out. I just want to hang out with you. Uh, there, there's so much chatter and excitement going on in my Patreon groups. We got uh, in the peep show. There's a lot of talk about like, ah, oh, man, I can't wait to meet all you sexy people in person. Uh, for the people who went to Man Whore Con last year, it's like, oh, I can't wait to see you again. We're discussing whether or not we can involve a poll because uh, quite a few of our listeners uh, do pole dancing. So, you know, it's just it's so fun. It's such a great weekend. And honestly, you know, it, for some people, it really is just a great excuse 
to take a trip to New York City. I know a lot of you may not get to travel all the time. I know you want to get the most out of your paid time off. And I think Manhorcon's a great reason to use that PTO, you know? Uh, you know, you come hang out with me, you come do some fun shit, uh, and then in, the, in your spare time, you can go look at the Statue of Liberty. I promise you don't really need to climb it, but if you can go look at it and you'll be like, oh, that's a, that's the Statue of Liberty. I've, I saw that in a movie. It's a lot smaller than I thought. Yes. Uh, spoiler alert. The Statue of Liberty, way smaller than you, uh, than you might think it is. So if you want to join me and your fellow fan whores in New York City this August, go get your weekend pass today at manwhorepod.com slash weekend. Here's another thing we're doing. Uh, I like to find excuses to order shit on the internet and then give it to my Patreon supporters because I'm that kind of guy. I don't know. I like uh, challenge my, challenging my graphic design skills and giving you something fun. So we're running a special offer on Patreon right now, okay, to celebrate five years of podcasting, five years of chatting with my exes, five years of oversharing and interrupting the guest. We're doing a special offer. All Patreon members pledging at least $2 will receive a, uh, a fun bumper sticker that says, honk if you're into consent. Yeah, I know. It's cute. It's a little cheesy, but I think that's a fun thing to have on the back of your car. Yeah, either that person behind you is super into consent or your tail lights out. Uh, you know, either way, maybe you should pull over and find out. You know what I mean? Become a member today. Qualify for your bumper sticker. Head on over to patreon.com slash man podcast. It's a great way to support me and the work that I'm doing with the show and get a little bit of fun stuff for yourself. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash man whore podcast. Before we get to this week's guest, Riley Rays, uh, you know, obviously we have the five year pod anniversary on April 16th. Uh, and, and I did a to celebrate a Reddit AMA. I want to give a shout out to everybody who participated. Like, thank you for making my anniversary so much more fun, so much more interesting so I want to read some of the questions that I, uh, some of my favorite questions, uh, some, or, or I should say some of my favorite questions that you all don't know the answers to already. Uh, this first one comes from Drew underscore 30. He said, who would be your dream guest? Would it be somebody you dated or had a thing with or somebody in the public eye, such as a porn star? Hmm. This week's guest is a porn star. Uh, curious to know if you've got that one big, never going to happen guest that you want. Um, I answered this in three parts. Uh, someone I dated that I would love to have on the show is either my first kiss or my, my ex-girlfriend of nearly two years, Paige. Um, one of them I have so many questions for, and the other one would probably break me. Y'all are welcome to guess which. Um, in, in terms of public people, I think just some of my favorites off the top of my head that I would love to have on, uh, Dan Savage, of course, Kevin Smith. Would love to discuss Chasing Amy in 2019 with Kevin Smith and, you know, Bay, a.k.a. Susan Sarandon, because that woman will always have my heart. I don't care how old she gets. She is a fine ass lady and a phenomenal actress. And, and also that never going to happen guest. Oh, Barack Obama. No shit. G we all want to know about the first time he fucked in the Oval Office. We all want to know. But if anyone from his team is listening, I would ask more respectful questions like, oh, hey, how did you maintain your marriage while running a fucking country? Those, those are some guests I would really like to have. This next question, uh, what episode are you most proud of? From an editing standpoint, because I've talked a lot about some of my favorite episodes and ones I'm proud of for various reasons, but I don't think I've ever talked about like the technical aspect of doing this podcast. Uh, so from an editing standpoint, I think that uh, desire resorts episode episode 232 i think that one is the one i'm most proud of because there were just so many moving parts uh and there was also so much raw audio that you know i, I was working with and I, I really challenged myself um technically i mean i don't usually do like a lot of editing uh of the interviews i usually let them speak for themselves uh let alone you know i don't i don't i definitely don't put together magazine style episodes all the time but at Desire Resorts, you know, of course, you all know, they invited me down there to Mexico to record something. And we ended up having that couple fuck 
in our suite while, you know, Kenzie and I and our neighbors kind of watched them and did commentary. And then it became this big roundtable discussion. But then on top of the general discussion with the group, we had all those cuts to the different couples that I interviewed uh, more briefly the next day. And so I was just working with a lot of audio and I was trying to figure out how to put all these pieces together and which quotes and which sections of which interviews to include. And it all just came together super nicely and I got so many compliments. So thank you to anyone who like emailed me and was like, that was awesome because it was so much fucking work. I was really proud of that episode from a technical standpoint. And speaking of technical uh, technicalities, you know, somebody else, uh, uh, I guess we would pronounce as Elgiac. She asked how much editing is required to make a cohesive interview. And like I said, I, I try not to edit too much, but if the conversation is really good, I'm usually not editing at all. So I just have to listen to the whole conversation one time. Then I got to do the interview, which has a little extra editing in it. I got to write show notes, make a promo image, stuff like that. So best case scenario, an hour long interview recording yields about three hours of work between listening to it, show notes, all that stuff, three hours. So I would say the average episode is three to five hours. And another question uh, that she asked was, in my big giant relationship spreadsheet that y'all have heard about, how many holdouts are left? That was a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> I, Without literally counting, but just eyeballing it, about 100 women have either declined or just not answered me when I've asked them to do the show. About 100 women have said no. It's a tough sell. This is not the easiest pitch you know, to say to someone, let alone someone who made the mistake of getting naked with you once upon a time. Uh, then, then there's like another 50 to 70 women that I have not formally asked to do the show. There's still like another 50 to 70 in the wings. And, uh, and, and I'll be honest with you. I don't think I'm going to ask all of them. I, I do think that um, as this show evolves, I'm going to be a little bit more picky and choosy over which past hookups I want on. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on the quality um over just, ah, uh, I got to get like a past hookup. It's like, you know, like I think I've proven myself. Uh, and then there's, you know, also just a cluster of, of folks who uh, will never be on the podcast because I just don't know who they are. Uh, I will never be able to reach them because they were like Craigslist or Reddit encounters where everything was done through a Craigslist proxy email address or there were no phone numbers exchanged or anything. Or I have a kick handle, but that kick handle has since gone ghost. And then there's also that one Russian chick I made out with in a bar because her gay bestie made us and then I never got her number. That's a different story. <laughs> uh, so, so how many are holdouts? Eh, about 100. <laughs> All right. Uh, I got two questions left I want to read you. One, uh, one hung low 35. He asked, have you ever been in a dead bedroom relationship? And if so, how did you overcome that? Oh, look at that. Now we got a bit more of a serious question. Uh, so so you know, since I haven't cohabitated with anyone, I don't think it'd be fair to call anything for me a dead bedroom situation. But I do go through periods of low libido, and I'm I, I kind of sort of in one right now. Um, and that's usually tied directly to my diet and my weight. As we all know, Billy struggles with body image, and, and I have for a long time. And when I feel full or feel fat, it's hard for me to feel sexy. And if I don't feel sexy, I usually don't want to fuck. However, um, I still stay in like a service mood. So, you know, if I'm feeling gross, I can still enthusiastically go down on someone during low libido phases. But I, I don't necessarily always want um, to be fucking. And this can really suck as a man because, you know, as, as dudes, we're expected not only to want to fuck all the time, but we also are expected to want to fuck anyone who consents. And we're even expected uh, in some cases to want to fuck people who don't consent. Like just people just assume like, oh, that's a dude with a dick. He be fucking or he wants to be fucking. So, um, so, you know, actually a lot of women can mistakenly take it um, as being about them. They can take it personally, even though it has nothing to do with them. It has all to do with me and how I'm feeling about my body. 
And what's even fucking worse is, uh, guys, we don't talk about it because for some reason to not be horny and hard all the time makes you less of a man. So we don't even get that outlet to share this emotion for fear of ridicule. And we just got to keep it inside and it fucking sucks. So for me, there, you know, there haven't really been dead bedroom situations, just low libido on my end at times. And I've gone through it by communicating to my partner what's going on, not closing myself off and finding how we can still be physically intimate, even if um, I am not super into doing the whole shebang. Uh, this last question is just a silly one. It comes from someone with the username motherfucker. <laughs> and they asked, what's your favorite sandwich, man? Which I interpret as, what's your favorite sandwich, comma, man? To which I answered, peanut butter sandwich with chocolate chips. We're not going to argue about this one. That's my preference. It's my body, my choice. But then somebody else chimed in and was like, uh, I think he asked, what's your favorite sandwich, man? Not what's your favorite sandwich, man? Which is a completely different answer. In which case... Uh, the answer is the dude with missing teeth who does grilled cheeses at the NYU third North dining hall. That's my favorite sandwich, man. He made phenomenal grilled cheeses for me for four years. If I, if it wasn't so expensive to just eat at the dining hall, I would have kept eating at the NYU third North dining hall for years. Uh, cause he did a mean grilled cheese. So, you know, thanks everyone who, uh, you know, chimed in during that AMA and made it really fun and special. If you want to check it out, uh, I did put a link to the AMA in the show notes of this episode. All right. Riley Rays is not the only porn star you can hear this week on the Man Whore podcast. Yesterday, I surprised folks, and, and you probably saw it in your, your little feed here. I dropped a free bonus episode with Nina Hartley. No big deal. Yes, the Nina Harley, the one and only, the fabulous, the wonderful, okay? But don't worry, I didn't put it behind a paywall. This isn't a trick to get you to give me money. I did put it up on Patreon exclusively, but it is over there for free. All you got to do is go to patreon.com slash manhood podcast. Just click the follow button. You don't even have to put a credit card down. Click follow. It's going to ask you to make an account. You just put an email address in. Boom, baby, boom. Now you can get updated every month when I drop a free bonus episode. Oh, yeah. So not only to kick that routine off, but also to celebrate five years of the Manwar Podcast. Yesterday, I dropped a great, great bonus episode with Nina Hartley. In that one, we talked a lot about like alpha versus beta males and gender roles. And Nina uh, reminded me that next time I'm in, I'm in Los Angeles, uh, she would give me a hand job. So you know, a lot of cool stuff in that episode. You're not going to want to miss it. Again, uh, patreon.com slash manwhore podcast. But if you do want to give me a few dollars, you do get that fun bumper sticker if you are pledged by May 1st, on May 1st. Um, and before we get to Riley, we're going to just do real quickly the fan whore appreciation moment. I don't even need to read the URLs or explain what the benefits are because I did that earlier. So I'm just going to give three fabulous fan whores some quick shout outs right now. Okay. Uh, thank you to Hunter S. Johnson. He is back. He had his angry email two weeks ago. He sent his mea culpa last week and then he repledged and I thank him for it. Uh, shout out to him. Uh, thank you, Jeremiah. You came, you saw, you jerked it to the peep show and then you left. I hope it was fabulous for you, sir. <laughs> and thank you to Heidi Banda, who is a referred patron. This is why you got to tell your friends, everybody. Uh, you tell your friends about the Man Whore Podcast. Then you join up on Patreon. Then you tell them how much fun you're having in the peep show and the champagne room and all these digital friends you're making. And then they're like, I want to be a part of that. And then they go and they give Billy money and then Billy gets to pay his rent. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so uh, thank you, Heidi, for joining up. We are uh, thoroughly enjoying you in the peep show. Okay, and now for Riley Ray's, everybody. Uh, this is another one of those episodes I recorded in Las Vegas uh, while I was at the AVN Awards. Yeah, back in January. Had a fabulous conversation with Riley. Uh, I do want to make a little note. My voice, again, just like last week. My voice is really shitty in this episode, 
because I was an idiot. And I closed down a bar at 4 a.m. two days before I had to record a dozen episodes. We live, we learn, and I apologize for not the quality of the episode, but the quality of my voice in the episode. Let's go chat with Riley Rays. Wait, wait, before we get to Riley Rays, I need to tell you about HotMovies.com. Not only is it an ethical and affordable way to hashtag pay for some of your porn, but there are also a bunch of videos featuring this week's guest. I mean, you can hear some of it right now. Uh, That's a a title called Yoni Training. You can only imagine what that's about. Uh, Some of her other titles include Fuck That Harry Bush, You Slipped Up Mom, and uh, Desperate Housewives Crave Fresh Cock 3. But you can watch all these wonderful videos with Riley Rays at HotMovies.com, as well as hundreds of thousands of other videos by pretty much any star you can think of. And Hot Movies is going to give you 20 free minutes on the house on them when you sign up with promo code MANHOR. That goes on to any package of minutes you purchase, or if you want to do the free trial, uh, you get your 20 minutes added on over there. Again, go to hotmovies.com, use promo code MANHOR, and then go jerk off to Riley Ray's. But first, we should get to know her better. I just found out, did you know India, you know who India Moore is? No. She's on Pose. She's like one of the trans actors on Pose. Oh, very cool. And apparently she's like out and open as Polly. And I was like, yo, we got like a Polly celebrity. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's really cool because there are plenty of uh, celebrities in ethical and non-monogamous relationships, but they don't necessarily talk about it. Yeah. And I think uh, we need to get that out there now. That's the next step to making Polly seem normal because, I mean, we can put in as many like movies or TV shows. But I think when we start seeing like the famous people or powerful people say they do anything but monogamy, I think that's when it starts to look normal to Nebraska. Yeah, there are a few public open marriages, but I think that's about it. What are the ones that you can think of? Um, I think Will Smith is pretty open about being open with his wife. And there recently was an actress who wrote an op-ed about being in a polyamorous relationship, but I cannot for the life of me remember who. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, but you yourself are also poly, right? I am. Yeah. And I'm sitting right now with the wonderful Riley Reyes. Is it Reyes? Reyes? It's a uh, Reyes or Reyes, okay. depending how white you are. Oh, <laughs> which one's the whiter one? I am quite uh, Caucasian. <laughs> Reyes. Let's do Reyes. Reyes. Real fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm glad we could finally chat. You are an adult entertainment performer. <laughs> As some would call a porn star. I'm comfortable with all the different nomenclature. I feel like we should claim the word pornography. It was something that was originally used to talk about how dirty and gross it is, but it's so pervasive now as the colloquial term for what we make that I think we have to own it. What do you think about like the starlet uh, term? Is that like a backhanded like type of thing to call somebody? I think calling someone a starlet implies that they're new or that they haven't reached superstar status. Uh I actually feel a lot more comfortable calling myself a starlet a lot of the times because it doesn't feel like I'm boasting. (laughs) It's like less grandiose. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Um, Is there like a, I imagine there's that point in time though in a career where you finally get to be like, no, now I'm a porn star. I'm starting to get there where I'm no longer as uncomfortable claiming the title. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, I don't know, there's all those like low entry level positions that like they have a grandiose title and then you just find out they do spreadsheets like for their boss. <laughs> and it's like, oh, they're like, I'm an executive, whatever, whatever. I'm like, no, you like you get coffee. Uh, I watched you. <laughs> like, so I don't know. That's fun. How, how long have you been doing uh, the porns? I've been in porn for about five years. Okay. So I we actually met very briefly, uh, like right before you moved out to L.A., and then like, just like my girlfriend at the time was just casually like, yeah, you know, she, that's, that's so, so she's, you know, she's about to go to LA and do porn. Like, and I was like, oh, okay. Just like casually me and that. And that was like the first time I had been like meeting anyone like that in the industry, just like casually at, in someone's living room. Yeah. I was just there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you were originally in, in New York. Yeah. I, uh, I lived in Brooklyn for my entire early twenties. And for the first few years of the adult industry, I was actually commuting back and forth and keeping two careers half going at once. What was the other career, if you care to share? Oh, yeah. I was working in uh, in production in the arts in New York. Oh, like uh, like film, theater stuff? Uh, theater, commercials. Sure. I freelanced, so. Gotcha. Oh, as an editor? Oh, no, no, no. Oh. Not as an editor. <laughs> I, I worked on the scenery. 
Okay, <laughs> very fun. And w- were you shooting, though, in New York at all? Not really. There okay. isn't a lot of production in New York. So when I was in New York, I was mostly focused on my art. And when I was in LA, I was focused on porn. That still baffles me that New York doesn't have, like, there's not just like someone got like a major, like there's major, there should be made like these big lofts that are just like porn studios in New York. I don't understand why that hasn't become a thing. Cause like, I feel like a lot of people would rather otherwise live in New York. Yeah, it's certainly an expensive place with lots of beautiful young people who come there with big dreams. It seems ripe for it. Yeah. Like, no, no, no. Like, I just want to live in the world where like someone's like, I'm going to move to New York to do porn. Uh, I would have loved to stay in New York and do porn. It took me a while to adjust to Los Angeles. It's very different. Yeah. What was the differences like for you? For me, the biggest game changer was when I finally uh, learned how to drive and got a car. Because living in L.A. and relying only on Ubers is the most isolating, depressing experience. But once you can get around, it's nice. You can go to the mountains, go to the beach, do anything you want. Where would you grow up that you didn't? Did you grow up New York based? Uh, no, I grew up in South Carolina, but I went away to boarding school when I was you small enough that I didn't, too? I didn't learn to drive. Did you go to boarding school in the South? Yeah, okay. I went to like a sort of a, a statewide uh boarding school you uh i've the boarding school experience though is so out there where you you did high school or did you also do some like middle i did school high there? school so i lived on the other side of the state and i just focused on my studies the bunch of other kids who they were trying to keep us all from having sex with each other it was insane <laughs> Yeah, uh, the the what I like about the what I find funny about like rules at boarding schools, and then the kids who are upset that they have to follow them. Uh, so like we'd have kids like complaining about why can't I smoke cigarettes? Like I could smoke I could smoke cigarettes in my old high school. It's like no, you couldn't. It's just like you didn't live at your. You could just go home and then smoke your cigarettes, and your home now is your school, so you never get to smoke them. Or they'd be like, I smoke pot when I'm back home. It's like, yeah, and you're not there. So what do you what do you want school to say? Yeah, sure, smoke pot all you want. Like, yeah, and I mean, I feel like the security isn't as tight on a normal high school. You can just kind of slip around back by the dumpsters and have a cigarette if you want. But if you're at boarding school, you're there. They've got people patrolling the borders, making sure that nobody <laughs> makes it off with you, making sure they don't get sued by your parents. Oh, God, the lawsuit stuff, like, I think, so I went to, a, like, a, it was, like, a character building boarding school. It was basically, like, a problem kid boarding school, and then they tossed me to the wolves just because I was awkward and didn't have friends back home, oh, which no. was, ooh, rough place, but uh, I, would just, I would see the links people would go to, like, break the rules, like, people who want, like, kids who wanted to drink and couldn't get alcohol, they were, like, chug Listerine. There was literally a kid, Malcolm, who would, he, we call him, he would like go get a bunch of Listerine at Walmart and he would like secretly like deal it on campus. And so in my mind, I loved imagining him just like, yo, what you want? I got that list, oh man, you want that mint? You want that orange? I got you. It's like, <laughs> what's happening? Or like people would just go free, people would break into like a school bus just to smoke a cigarette when it was like two degrees outside in Connecticut. And I was like, is smoking that fun? <laughs> My favorite one was uh, I knew a girl who liked to sneak regularly into the guy's side of the dorms just by wearing a big hoodie and going in with a group of guys so that she could play Halo. Okay. <laughs> she wanted to go play Halo with her buddies and that was the way for her to do it. She's like, none of these chicks play Halo. Like, I just, it's, it's like she should have been given like a special, pa- like a Halo pass to be like, look, oh, I swear I'm not going to fuck anybody. I just want to play some video games. <laughs> Yeah, as, let's see. On my hall, everyone was really, really into Kingdom Hearts right about then. <laughs> oh, I remember Kingdom Hearts. Kingdom Hearts was fire. Oh, that was like one of my favorite N64 games way back when. Um, yeah, no, boarding school is such an honest So why did you go to uh, a boarding school? Or do you, is that? Oh, I went because I was gifted. Gifted? Uh, what's Which type of gifted? Gifted in 2019 can mean all sorts of things. Oh, it was, um, it was an art it was an art school. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I have to say, some of the academics that I got there were better than the freshman year academics I got at my college because they were very serious. Yeah, because they were like, no, we're going to put you, you're going to go to Niada. I know that's not real. I know it's a glee school, <laughs> but that's why I like the match. Exactly. <laughs> it was like that. <laughs> oh, that's super cool. So, so you like, you, at the time you thought you were going to be an actress? Uh, at the time, I not that you're not an do, actress. I wanted, <laughs> at the time, I type. wanted to do visual art and painting. Oh. I figured I might be a designer, and then I got into backstage theater, art and design, and 
Then I got really into sex parties on the weekends, and then I discovered I could get paid to have sex with attractive people, and now here I am. That's quite the that's that's the way to make it. So when I I used to interview stand up comedians a lot at, at an old job, and I, the path to like these like it was like big big names, and their path to becoming a famous successful stand up comedian, every path was different. And I like to think that in porn, like yeah, no, everyone had a different path. There's no right way to to get there. And you were like, no, I went to art school, art board school and then i ended up doing porn that's that was my path <laughs> yeah and i mean i had a career before i did this that i liked very much and that i was very respectable that i could go home and brag to my family about now i'm a little less so They're not, but i not love fans. it very much <laughs> uh you know they're supportive the first few years were a little rough it was like it was like coming out gay to a religious family who still wants to love and support you very much they wanted to love and support uh -huh. me, but they were really worried I was falling in with a bad element and that I was throwing away my life that I'd worked so hard on. But now, uh, five years later, I love it. I have savings. I'm happy and comfortable. And I'm working with an advocacy group to help people in my industry. Last year, my mother finally told me she was proud of me, and I hey, cried. Good. <laughs> That's awesome. I've, I very frequently, frequently will, uh, I've, I've been seeing over the years the parallels between like coming up in stand up, coming up in like porn and like where some of the similarities are. There are career paths that not all parents are thrilled about. Uh, cause at least if you go and say like, oh no, I'm like acting or I'm right. Like at least that's a thing they can see. And, uh, I feel like, like comedy, porn, they're worried. And I'm just like, I don't know why. And also like the whole like having to come up in the like doing like not maybe the best stuff in the beginning. And then you get to do the better gigs later on. And yeah, you finally get to a point where you're doing stuff that you can brag about. I can send some of the pretty girl stills from the more high end things to my mother and be like, look at the beautiful dress they put me in today, ma. Yeah. I mean, like some I've heard some people compare like like call stand up like the porn of entertainment of like of the performing arts, so to speak. I've never heard that before, but I like it. Yeah, yeah. It's just like, or, or no, if it was like, um, someone said something like, if if comedy was porn, stand up is anal, or something like that. <laughs> like we're definitely like towards the bottom of that chart. Um, it's interesting when you say like coming out like as doing porn, like it was similar to like coming out as queer uh, to like a, a religious family who like wants to be supportive. Do you think like part of that could be just they can't not they're they're having they would be supportive if they didn't picture you naked in what you're coming out about? Because I feel like also I feel like maybe if coming out as like gay didn't mean like picturing your son getting fucked by another man like oh maybe the dad wouldn't be so free because he doesn't have this image but he can't get this image he's uncomfortable with out of his head yeah i think it's the combination between the stigmatization of sexuality and the idea that both of those things are considered somewhat dangerous or difficult lives to lead and no parent wants that for their kid mm. they want you to be happy and safe and secure and both of those things sound kind of risky and scary yeah the secure part i think a lot of times tends to be like with finances which is like like people like parents want your kid to be like financially secure which is why the arts tends to not always get the like most positive reaction your your family seemed cool with like you being an artist oh they were always really supportive types of people sort of uh, hippy dippy folks. I was the only person in South Carolina who I knew in elementary school who didn't go to church, and my family was vegetarian. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't go to church. Not raised religious or anything. Nope. I was just a weirdo in South Carolina. The other kids in school told me I was a witch because we meditated. Ah! She didn't go to church. She's a witch. Wait, why do they think that you're a witch? Uh, because I told them that my family meditated. Wrong move. I didn't know. I was seven. <laughs> That's like the like an updated uh, Monty Python sketch of just like she's a witch. She meditates and does yoga and eats quinoa. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, did you did you find any sort of religion yourself at some point? No, I never. I never found religion. I went through a pretty intense uh, spiritual phase throughout high school. I was really into a lot of just kind of the flowy idea of the energy of the universe. But as I got older, that sort of fell away, and I'm just an atheist now. Okay, I feel like that's a that's a harder one to like come. The coming out to my mom as an atheist, like that was a thing that like kind of brought tears. Oh yeah, that can be wild when you have a family who 
has faith as a strong element of who they are. Yeah. I looked down. My mom's the, uh, she's like the, she, her Jesus is the Jesus that loves everybody. Um, but she like also was sad. Like I didn't get confirmed. She was that type. I actually had my aunt Carrie cried on the phone. When I told her I was an atheist for the first time. I think I was like maybe like 16. She cried and she's like, Billy, if you ever change your mind and you want to come back and believe in God again, you let me know. Um, because <laughs> I'll I hook you up. Literally, she said. She said the words. I can make that happen. And I'm like, I don't think that's how it works. I don't think I need a referral to go back. I think I can just show up on Sunday. I'm a big fan of uh, the Jesus who loves everybody, though. I I adore his work. Jesus seems great. Uh, I I really enjoy the things that that character did in the book. Uh, <laughs> you know, the things he did in the book were really great. Uh, sometimes I'm annoyed by the things that his purported followers are into, but. Man, Jesus by the book was an awesome dude and <laughs> yeah. supported sex workers. So, yeah, it's like, yeah, right, right. Uh, it's just, I don't know, like his, like him, great. His fans, not so great. Kind of like Juggalos, like uh, Insane Clown Posse, like, okay, uh, Juggalos, not all the best people. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's fun. Now, you, you mentioned you uh, got into the sex party scene in New York. I did. How did you fall? Did, were you, did you go to college in, in the city? No, I went to college in North Carolina. I'll tell you how I got into the scene. Okay. I was on OkCupid and... uh, (laughs) That's how it starts. (laughs) I met this beautiful blue haired girl. We went on a few dates and then she said to me, would you like to come to a sex party on a yacht? And I said, yes, of of course. Everybody wants to go to a sex party on a yacht. Who would say no to such an offer? Even if you just wanted to get on a yacht, you'd be like, I will endure a sex party to just get on a yacht. <laughs> yeah, there was a, at that point with, you know, my tits out drinking champagne looking across the Statue of Liberty that I knew I had truly arrived at the life I wanted. Yeah, that that is uh cuz once upon a time there were immigrants coming in on this ship looking at the Statue of Liberty so one day their their and their uh their their children's children's children could go to a fuck party on a yacht in the Hudson River. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> How was, that was the yacht party. It, the yacht party was incredible and being sort of a flexible, you know, bisexual young woman who was interested in playing with lots of types of people. Uh, I was very popular. Mm. I ended up being quite the party favor and I got invited to many more things from there. And that's how I got in pretty much immediately. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, you belong here. Also, you'll bone me and my husband, <laughs> which is sometimes a hard sell, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's uh, people are like, oh, how do you get invited to all these other parties? Like, if you're a woman, go to the party, be very attractive, and and especially if you're a queer woman, going great. If you're a guy and you want to get invited to the parties after your first party, you got to go and like extra behave. Like, you have to almost like flaunt how behaving you are to be like that dude didn't rape anybody. We'll give him another shot this next. Yeah. One. Whereas my main sell is that girl played with a lot of people and she's cute. We should bring her back. <laughs> yeah, she's fun. Um, so what parties were you going to in, in the city? Um, it started out being a Hacienda. And there's also a really like high-end hotel loft party that's, uh, I think, secret. Top floor? Yeah. Okay, we talk about that. Right. I wasn't well, top sure floor, I think, is over. Anymore. And I think now it's called like Alexandria or something. Oh, okay. I, think like- I had heard top floor might be getting discontinued, but I didn't want to break their silence <laughs> if that wasn't the case. Since I'm not really involved sure. in the New York scene anymore, I don't know what's happening there. Sure, sure. Uh, Hacienda, great. Also, like, you know, friend of the pod, Hacienda. Um, we've had, like, a lot of those folks on. And then um, there was also smaller parties. I ended up making friends. And so there would be small play parties at people's lofts and apartments that might be more like five to ten folks that have been sort of handpicked who liked each other. So I'd go to a lot of things like that, too. Uh, at my peak, I was trying to go out and play at least once a week. I was all over it. You you're you were the person going every week. Yep. I so I you know all like my comedy friends would be like, well, tell me about, what's the fuck with these sex parties? Like, dude, I mean, you could go to like I don't know three parties a week every week if you want to. Sounds exhausting to me. It was exhausting. <laughs> After a while, I was like, whoo, I need to take some time on myself. <laughs> yeah, it's like I I one time my I went to two parties in a night and I was like no no this is not for me I was just so excited it was so liberating it was this world that I never knew existed that was suddenly open to me I mean I had been a kid in college in Carolina looking at 
the John Cameron Mitchell movie Short Bus and saying, oh, it would be so cool if that could be my life. But like that doesn't really exist. And suddenly I was living Short Bus. That movie I found like sophomore year of high school. I secret, I like, I ordered it and I found this nudity and so I had to like secretly watch it like in my bed on my little portable DVD player. But like that was the first movie where I was like, is this a real thing? This seems magic. This seems awesome. I have bought and then I've had to, re- I have overpaid for that DVD because they don't make it anymore because oh, no. it's just, it's so, I really do think it represents, uh, you know, or gives an idea of what like that kind of artsy sex party scene in New York can be. Um, it was like my first introduction to like seeing queerness on a screen. Like it's, uh, oh, I love that movie. Then I, t- I tried to make a bunch of like poly folk have a little, like we had like a little um, date night to watch it. They didn't seem to like it as much, but I was oh, so that into makes it. Me sad. I <laughs> love everything John Cameron Mitchell does. And I really found a lot of inspiration in that film. And I, I couldn't believe it was real when I found it. And Hacienda, Hacienda was like my first like proper sex party. And that felt like, because Hacienda is not like every sex, like most parties, I would, I think. Yeah, I, think I really type. like the the sort of theme party with, you know, cabaret style entertainment mm. that they often provide. Yeah. And it felt, it felt like kind of short bussy. And then like everything else, any party I've been to that wasn't Hacienda has always felt like kind of less than because... I felt like this was the vibe I've always like kind of wanted. These are the people I want to be around. And yeah, I just oh, so dig it. Yeah. I've I, also never heard I'm anyone trouble. bring up short bus ever in my life. I am always the short bus advocate. So I'm so thrilled to hear you bring oh, yeah. it up. I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. One time, uh, I think at Pride once, I was walking like, I was trying to walk like somewhere and I, I passed by and I was like, sitting on the bench just casually is John Cameron Mitchell and he's sitting there like he's not John Cameron Mitchell I'm like how dare you just sit there so like casually and I had to like I stood I stood like maybe like 100 feet away for about 10 minutes debating whether or not to say like hey hi I just want to say like your work is like awesome and thanks for doing it and then I run away and then never did and then uh, I regretted it every day <laughs> so there was a beautiful bisexual man a little bit older than me who I hooked up with one time and I was telling him the story of how that film inspired me. And then he said, oh, yeah, I was in that. What? Oh, I was I was in as one of the background characters because I was, you know, involved in the scene at the same time as John Cameron Mitchell. And I said, you son of a bitch. So I thought <laughs> someone who was in it, technically. That's awesome. <laughs> I didn't know at the time. <laughs> was part of seeing short. So you said, when did you find short bus? I found it when I was in college. Okay. So did, did any of that movie like do like affirm anything for you? Was there any sort of like validation seeing something maybe you had imagined or wanted or, you know, maybe saw something on screen that you felt that you didn't see in other media? You know, I I was really happy to see it because they seemed like people like me, but I also was disheartened by it because I felt like it was a utopia that didn't exist. Uh, So when I found my way to that yacht, suddenly it all clicked together and I was just so elated. The yacht party, amazing. Um, And so have you like, (laughs) when you moved to LA, did you have to go find, I gotta imagine it wasn't that hard to find, but like, did you go find the scene? I haven't found it. Really? I was too afraid to try to find something like that again. I was afraid I'll go to parties, but they'll just be like swinger parties. They won't have that sort of like free love, kind of young, creative burner energy like the scene I was with in New York. And since I was already having so much sex for work, I just kind of let it fall by the wayside. So I haven't found the scene because I I didn't know how to look for it. Is it something you want in your life uh, again at some point? I'd love to be connected to the community and have the option of going to parties. I don't think I need to do weekly again ever though. <laughs> yeah, it's not like not only exhausting but like expensive. Um uh you know, I mean the Hacienda's now are like 80 bucks a pop. They've uh, mm-hmm. they've been coming up. I don't know what what they were like when you were going cuz I think you were going to them like uh you stopped going to them around when I started. And I would frequently volunteer in exchange for things yeah. and again you know, if you're like a sweet, cute girl who plays a lot, people will let you move up the volunteer list. They're like, oh, she's a broke artist, but she really cares about the community and the parties. Yeah, let her do a thing in exchange for a ticket. So Yeah, that's the, that's the other thing. Like there's parties like a chemistry, like it does. there's not that community feeling where it's like, well, we know her and we know her situation. And that's why we have this volunteer position, not just so someone who could afford a ticket can come for free. Um, there's like that kind of general, like we want to help each other out vibe and i don't know it's just just, you feel like everyone cares about each other even no one knows each other 
Yeah, it's really a very warm and welcoming community. And it's part of what made me feel that I could get into porn. It, not only is it one of the things that made me want to do porn, it's one of the things that made me feel like if I did it, I wouldn't be a pariah forever. Mm -hmm. Because that's what people teach you. If you get into porn, you'll ruin your whole life. Like this idea that you have to choose between being fuckable or lovable. And if you go that far on the end of the fuckable spectrum, you'll be sort of cast out. Suddenly, I found this group of people who were really, really into sex and still respected me emotionally and intellectually. And I realized that I could do this and still be someone who was loved and who had a full life. Yeah, because it's, a, I mean, like that type of, that whole poly burner world. It's all about like, want to do porn? Yeah, you want to do some sex work? Fucking do it. You want to you, you want to make, uh, you know, portraits with your period, bro? Like, God bless you. Like, do the thing. <laughs> like, that's just like the vibe they're going for. And I don't know, it's just a beautiful thing to me. I mean, I, I like, I have a, not in the same exact way, but similarly like that, uh, I worried, uh, I worried for a long time. I was too, fu I was like too fuckable, which is weird because I look the way I do. Uh, I look very dateable, I think. I think I look more dateable than fuckable. But like I started this podcast because like people would sleep with me, but they wouldn't date me. And I wanted love and a girlfriend, but I also enjoyed like fun, various sexual experiences. And I knew like monogamy maybe wasn't the relationship model for me. And so like I also worried like, oh, have I gone too far? Like go did going to a bukkake when I was 22 mean that like I either have to lie about it or, you know, I won't be able to like have a girlfriend or something? You know, the play and poly scene is a little tough for dating because if you meet people in a sexual context at these parties, they're meeting so many folks, so many people who are attractive, so many people who are interesting. It can be hard to fit yourself onto their dance card, make an impression and get a real connection. Mm. You know, you, you meet a lot of great people, but a lot of times you're, you're passing like ships in the night and especially I know for guys. Because for women, there are lots of people who want to like, you know, nail down their their little manic pixie dream girl poly wife. But <laughs> but then you're trying to talk to these these girls who are so inundated with options that it can be easy to just flit around from one to the other and never take time to build a connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, so wait, how did it, you know? I, I don't really. I normally try to avoid the like. How'd you get in the porn story? But I find it interesting. It went the path that it was. So how did you go from like Brooklyn Poly Burner sex parties to porn? You know, I was sitting one day painting at work, and I thought, wouldn't it be store, cool? Store some paint. Wouldn't it be cool if if the party on the weekend was my job? I spent enough time doing it. Might as well. And I'm like, well, there's escorting, but like, ugh, I want to have sex with like fun, pretty young people <laughs> like I do all the time. Wait, there's a job for that. I just have to be okay with my pussy being on the internet forever. That's a big choice. So I mulled it over for like six, nine months. And then I called up an agent, did some, yeah, did some research, tried to talk to people I knew or knew of who were in the industry who could let me know what it was like and read some books. Like what, what, what books did you read? Oh, gosh. There was one that uh, Zach Sabbath wrote about the adult industry. I forget what it was called, but I was a big fan of Mandy Morbid, who was his girlfriend at the time. I'm not sure if they're still together, but she was just this hot tattooed girl, and he was this cool artist slash alternative porn star, and I read his book, and I was like, you know what? These are tattooed D&D &D playing weirdos. They can do it, so can I. <laughs> What's that six to nine month period of f mulling it over? Like it's, it's, was it a, like you thought of it and then like every once in a blue moon it popped in your head or was it really like a, an active thinking and weighing options and looking into it? It was, it was pretty active. Uh -huh. I got this bee in my bonnet and I couldn't stop thinking about it. Bee in the bonnet. You are Southern. I am very Southern. <laughs> yeah. I'm full of colloquialisms. Yeah. But I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was something that I had thought about doing and entertained since I was a teenager, but I'd always written off and always written off. And then suddenly it was a real possibility to me. Suddenly it didn't mean my life was over. And that meant I had to consider it. And it was in my thoughts pretty frequently until I finally tried it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you reached out to like other stars, like what were those conversations like? Because like, uh, you know, Lainey Spicer, right? Mm -hmm. So like I've talked to Lainey, she says like, I've talked people out of doing porn. She's like, I'm, you know, like really making people like consider and think about it like that, you know? So what were, like, did anyone try to talk, any of the actual porn stars talk you out, try to talk you out of it almost? 
nobody tried to talk me out of it. Uh, people talked to me a bit about the pitfalls. And so for a while, I was juggling both careers, right? I wasn't letting go of my foothold in my career in the arts in New York because I knew I had that if for some reason porn didn't agree with me or I wasn't comfortable with it. I was really sort of hedging my bets yeah. early on. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what were some of like, the pitfalls they warned you about? Um, well, some of the biggest ones were just, you know, burnout or uh, predatory agents or producers. Right. Have you been, had, and did you end up coming across any of, uh, I guess we'll start with the predatory stuff and. Oh, uh, I absolutely saw plenty of relationships with agencies that were predatory and had a little bit of trouble with one of my early ones, but I think uh, that was mostly because it, I had decided it was time for me to, to leave them and I wanted to try something different and they were not pleased, but that's pretty common. Sure. When you're leaving uh, someone. Otherwise, folks have been very good to me, but I also tried to ask around a lot oh. because that was one of the first warnings I got. So I wasn't just going to look up any agency. I was going to talk to girls and see what faces they made. When I said the agency name, I was just going, <laughs> ooh, oh, you're going with that one? Mm, good luck. Yeah, you got to go with the face and not the words because I'd be like, oh, interesting choice. <laughs> exactly. And the most like contortioned face. Yeah, you got to watch watch the face they make. Watch for the delay before they speak, trying to figure out what to say to you. That tells you a lot. It sounds like you've been able to like navigate that whole uh, sphere pretty well and, and avoid some bad situations, yeah. I guess. Yeah, not everyone would necessarily have the presence of mind or the skills to do that, though. So I think it still is very important. What you're saying is you're make really it, awesome. It, I, I'm <laughs> you're not, like, not everyone could have uh, navigated that the way I did. What but. I was trying to say <laughs> is that we need to help the new girls who maybe have uh, are younger or have less acumen, and we need to work on making the industry a better place. So I can't just, you know, come out and be like, oh, I came out unscathed, so it's fine. I think it's important for me to give other people a, a hand up since I'm here and I'm comfortable. Sure. What do you think about the potential of uh, <clears throat> maybe not legally, but maybe as an industry standard, raising the minimum age for performers? You know, I'm like, are you familiar? Are you familiar with like the MBA's like rule? Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's still the case, but I remember at some point when I was like, when we were like in grade school, they changed the rule where you, uh, you had to have at least one year between high school and entering the draft. So whether that was a year of college or a year out, but the idea is to not have like these Kobe guys, like leaving high school at 16, getting injured when they're 19, have no college degree and now they're broke and destitute. So they would like make them have to at least wait a year. Um, so uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts maybe on that? I'm completely open to the idea of having a higher minimum age for folks to do porn. It's, it's a difficult industry and it can be particularly dangerous for someone who's just leaving their parents' house and has no idea of how to navigate life, doesn't understand things like rent schedules for model houses or, has never had to show up anywhere on time without their parents waking them up ever before in their life. A, a lot of people who are that young and into the industry have no life skills and jump into a place that could just chew them up and spit them out. Yeah. I mean, right now we're at the Adult Entertainment Expo and like there's a lot of uh, like My Free Cam sponsors the whole weekend, which like I've got feelings about. Um, but you know, you I'm you just see you just walk through the hallways. You see all these like you're like, how old are you? Like there's like who are you, like where's your? I, I'm walking around. Sometimes I'm like, where's your mother? Like where are you okay? Like um just because like they seem like they're just having great and having fun and all that. But like part of me is like ah like just like it's like a lot of like 18, 19, 20 year olds who seem like I don't know. It's just it's a weird vibe. Like I just think of myself at nineteen. I'm like oh god. Like I was. I mean, age notwithstanding, I think it's really important that we as an industry work on having better education and resources available to our performers. Like, I don't know if that comes in the form of a certification or a class. I certainly am going to be working this coming year with APAC to launch an educational video series on YouTube so that it can be easy and accessible. Mm. We hold plenty of workshops as it is to help people do their taxes, to help people know what to expect on set. But the people who are most vulnerable, who are most in need, aren't going to make it to our workshops in LA. They're not even going to know they exist. This way, a girl sitting in a model house in Florida could pull up a video on her phone that would let her know 
what a yeast infection is like or like what standard things are to pack in a model bag or what red flags are if you're self-booking for a company that might Mm. be a scam or dangerous. What are some red flags uh, someone should look out for? The most important thing is just to do screening. Mm -hmm. So basically you ask to see their website or their clip store and you ask to contact or reach out to the previous models that are pictured. Uh, If they can't give you references or a link, that's a big red flag. Uh, And a lot of people who are less than honest will tell you, oh, it's my, it's my first time. And I. Cool. Call me back when it's your fifth time or something. That's (laughs) what I tell them. I'm like, you know, why don't you just get a couple shoots under your belt and call me back. But that's a scary thing for whoever's going to be the first two girls. But I think the reality is most of the time when they're saying that, it isn't that they haven't hired any kind of sex worker for anything ever before. It's that perhaps they don't have good reviews. Because I'll, hell, if someone wants to start filming for their own clip store and they've seen escorts before, I'll take those references. Sure. I just want to know I'm going to be safe and paid mm-hmm. and that this is actually real. Yeah. You mentioned APAC. And uh, there, so do you want to just like say a little bit about what APAC oh, yeah. is? APAC is the Adult Performer Advocacy Committee. It's run by and for adult performers to provide them with representation in matters that affect them, to provide them with education, to provide them with resources. So if anyone listening to this is an adult performer who feels like they need help, or if they have a project that they want to do to help others, please talk to us. We'd love to collaborate and we'd love to help you. Yeah. Um, is it like a union? or Because like, I've been hearing like... I- Look, I'm very, I'm like very just adjacent, but like my Twitter feed will be full of a lot of like these things. And I'm like, is there, is there a porn union? Like, or uh, folks or- have been trying to get one together. I'm not necessarily optimistic about our ability to unionize because of our high turnover and the uh, spirit of independence that mm-hmm. many people in the industry have. Another crossover with stand up comedy that's made many attempts for a union just never f- holds through. Yeah. So, um, I, I love the idea of a union, but I'm not sure whether we could actually get enough people together to get collective bargaining power. We're just an advocacy group. We're a nonprofit. Mm. Um, are there like other groups that are kind of like that? I know there's the Free Speech Coalition, and the, I think APAC and, and FSC are the, the main ones I'm yeah, aware of. Yeah, um, the big groups to be aware of are APAC, which is by and for the performers, okay. uh, FSC, which represents the whole industry and has a board that contains producers, agents, and performers. And then uh, for the agents, there's Latata, which is the licensed group of adult agencies. Latata just sounds like a particular type of fetish porn to me, if I'm being honest with you. Yeah, well, you know, they (laughs) do I'm in the mood for some Latata. Oh, what website is that? That sounds like something you'd order at a tapas restaurant. (laughs) I'm hungry now. (laughs) Oh, that's fine. How'd you get involved with them? I mean, because like you've been in the industry about five years, which makes you like big veteran. Uh, because right, it's like is that, that yeah. Ever- if you stay in for more than two years, you're in. <laughs> yeah, it's like what? <laughs> um, but like, how'd you? Get, why was it important for you to you know go join up with that? You know, uh, it was the fight against Prop sixty. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a lot of people going out and protesting and marching against Prop 60. So I I joined to speak up and talk to legislators about how I felt about uh, forcing condoms onto our sets. And I went and spoke at OSHA hearings. And the folks who were on the board at the time told me that they thought I could serve. I never would have had the audacity to think that I could be a community leader before uh, I was encouraged by previous board members to go ahead and give it a shot. And now I'm chairing the organization and it turns out I can do this. Well, I mean, why, why, why don't you think you could have been a community organizer? You're a badass. Like, thank you. And I do have a background in activism. I guess I just like many people felt that that was something that was, the province of other folks, oh, other people who are better than me can do that. But at the end of the day, all it takes is people who are motivated to make the world a better place and are willing to put in the sweat to make that happen. And I'm really, really glad that they pushed me towards it because it's been incredible to make things that can help my yeah. community members. 
You uh, you mentioned like burnout and as, as another thing, like people were warning you about when you were going to, you're thinking about joining. And that's another thing that crosses over with the arts a lot. I mean, <laughs> I was just at this thing called Patreon, which is like a Patreon creator conference. And like they had multiple seminars that were about creator burnout. What's, what's like that burnout like in porn? Have you experienced that? Um, have you avoided it? You know, I've stayed comfortably and happily on the B list. And so I've <laughs> never been booking so much that I can't do anything. There are some like A-list performers who are like booked 20 days in a row and their vagina's tired and their butthole's tired and they need a break. But you know, I work a few days a week and then the rest of the week I get to work on my activism. I get to do the things I care about with with my girlfriend, with my friends. I get to do my martial arts. I actually- You do my way martial arts? Relative life of leisure. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Wait, what? what? We why? haven't talked about this yet. Yeah, <laughs> why was that not in my uh, briefing? I am how, what? How rude of my publicist to not mention <laughs> my jujitsu and Muay Thai. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the main thing I spend my spare time on when I'm not activisming. Why, 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 why jujitsu? What got you in the jujitsu? I quit Taekwondo when I was like nine. Uh, I was like, this is enough- <laughs> I uh, I always wanted to do martial arts since I was a kid, but throughout my adult life, I found that I never had the money for the expensive classes or I never had the spare time because I was working a ton of overtime or something. And suddenly, I had money and spare time and there was a jujitsu gym down the street. And so I went to try it and it's dope. <laughs> um, and you've mentioned activism several times. I you know I follow you on Twitter and I see that and I think... Uh, you seem like, you know, you're very socially, con uh, like you know, progressively conscious and all that stuff and social justice oriented. I think that, do you think that's like a product of like the generation you're coming up in as opposed to maybe like some of the older porn stars who maybe that's not as an important fight for them? Yeah, I think that there definitely are values and mores to each generation. And I am about to turn 30 and I am from a queer polyamorous community. I'm going to be this kind of a person this is this fits my profile completely none of it's surprising so how do you how do you incorporate your activism into your porn work you know in my porn work i just try to provide as like authentic and engaging a sexual experience as i can and then i use my platform sometimes to talk to people about queerness and about sexuality I just had a tweet that's been really lively where I'm last, telling guys that their penis size doesn't matter. I saw that last night. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, hard truth. Part of me was like, she hooked up with someone last night who like just, she had to kick out because he was obsessed about it. I was like. <laughs> no, it's just, it's something that I've been noticing over time. Anytime I go on Instagram live, there's always at least one person asking, oh, do you like big black cocks better? There's always one person asking, what's your ideal penis size? I've hooked up with a, with a lot of guys and a lot of times they're either overconfident because they're large or they're terrified that they're too small many times when they're not actually small at all and it seems like so much baggage to carry and it seems like it takes up so much time and mental energy and then there's people walking around and they don't know about the orgasm gap between men and women they don't know about the internal clitoris yet and i'm like spend your energy on that there's a lot to know mm -hmm. about sexuality and about pleasing women and most of it has nothing to do with penis size i hosted a gangbang on sunday night because that's i guess how my life works and Dope. there was a dude towards the end there's like a heavier say asian guy um you know and he like he's young and he he like he looked like he probably had, maybe is shy and all that stuff Aww. but he he comes to this gangbang um the woman's blindfolded at, uh, for it uh because that's what she wanted and so he's he had sex with her like towards the end but he also like went down on her a couple times made her legs shake like whoa like made her come it was his third time going down on someone ever damn he's just natural then he said he watched nina hartley's like oral sex videos and I can't wait to tell her this Nina week. Nina <laughs> Hartley eats pussy real good, and she's a great teacher. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, the dick, the dick size stuff. People got to stop obsessing over it. <laughs> There's just so much more to know. And if you get with someone who's a size queen, and that's really what they want, I'm always like, you have hands. Fist the girl. You'll figure it out. Like, everything is not about penis and vagina intercourse. You yeah. can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, so, like, last month... 
organized different gangbang for a friend. I don't normally organize gangbangs. It's been a weird month. Uh, but a friend, <laughs> friend in the community asked me to throw one for her. I was like, sure. And she had a maximum penis size. Her max was six inches. I actually had to talk her up to six inches from like five because like I was six inches and I was like, but I still want to be involved. Um, <laughs> so I'd like, so she, uh, she, yeah, for gangbangs, it can be really exhausting if people are huge. Right. That's all. That was the other factor. She's like, it's not that she never fucks big dicks, but it was like for the gangbang, she wanted to cap uh, in the size. So in the post I'm putting on Reddit, you know, I, I make, so I'm asking for information, some information from the applicants, one of them being like your penis size. I put in quotation marks, like, do not lie. She's looking for a specific size range. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I don't want you to lie just to get in it. And so many dudes... We're, like I nixed a lot of guys, but she made so many dudes day because the guys were saying he, they were six and a half inches. And I was like, sorry, man, you're a little too big for her. And they're like, really? Moi? <laughs> like, so it's like, cool. We made someone feel good. But also um, some guys would message back and be like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm actually like five and a half inches. I just you know thought she wanted bigger. So I said six and a half. I'm like, well, now I can't trust you. So you're out. Um, <laughs> but it's amazing. Like that guys like who just feel like they got to lie about the size just to get women interested. And it's yeah, like, no. it's a. It's really not high on most women's priority list. Now, of course, there are some women who really like penetrative intercourse and really want someone large. Yeah. It's true. I've, I've met them in porn. A lot of them go to porn because it's a place you can do that. <laughs> but it's just not the main thing. One of the things I always tell people on my Instagram live when they're like, what's your ideal penis size? I'm like, women don't care what size your penis is. By the time they're sleeping with you, they already know whether they're attracted to you. Yeah. So you should probably just be like kind and charming and take interest in their interests i don't know man <laughs> my favorite size is the one that's nice to me that's yeah like... i i care a lot more about the person it's attached to than i care about the dong if i wanted to get a dong i just buy one on the internet they can have them in all dimensions <laughs> yeah and all shapes and sizes have you seen bad dragon there's all different looks and models yeah um <laughs> i and... have an assortment but like if i wanted a dong i'd get a dong you're a person with a penis attached to you, the person is more important. Right. Also, there's a lot of dudes who like, uh, people in general, I think just misjudge sizes. Like I remember one of the earliest episodes of the show, like there's this, I was interviewing one of these like exes of mine and, and she's like, I love a big dick. I was like, what's big for you? And she says, uh, I like eight inches. I said, show me eight inches with like your fingers. And she did like whatever she thought that was. I was like, that's six. Uh, and she's like, what? I was like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking. Like, you're just saying eight cause you think eight's the big number or guys who are like five and a half inches don't realize that that's perfectly average. Uh, or that like a, there are dudes in porn whose dicks are not as big as they look like Tommy pistol. That's like the every guy dick. He's yeah, like, he's so, got like a, a, like a nice normal penis. He's yeah, great. Yeah. It's like, you don't need, you know, like people go like, Oh, I want a porn dick. I'm like, there's porn dicks that are not big it's just the camera in the same I've, apparently like the way cameras can add weight like i'm um, add the, pe- the, the the camera adds an inch you know it it's, adds girth yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, i mean honestly lots of times in porn you need a big dick just for the angles and the mm-hmm. way that we have to open up there's like an inch or two that's never going to go into the girl because you're opening up to camera yeah this so ridiculous one like on the couch where like you're both having your legs spread no one does that uh i've tried it's not practical it's not worth it <laughs> Uh, well, Riley, thanks so much for chatting with me. You've been fantastic. Thank you. Um, it was a pleasure. Be, yeah. Um, where can people find you, find your work, find your advocacy? Clearly, you like doing the Instagram lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, I recently had to make a new Instagram and got it deleted Did again. You, are, I got mine taken down too. I still haven't made the new one. I'm still like being stubborn about it. Yeah, I'm being stubborn too. But you can find so. me on Twitter at RileyRayXXX. That's R-I-L-E-Y-R-E-Y-X-X-X. And that will include links to anything else. And you can always shoot me a message or an email to ask me anything you're interested in. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Oh, that was a fun chat. Uh, You know, if you have a good Los Angeles sex party, maybe a nice queer, inclusive, gender neutral, burner-esque vibe going on at your play party in LA uh, you should go tweet at Riley you know it seems like she could use a good recommendation of course I would love to I love hearing your feedback on these shows okay you can tweet at me at the Billy Presida or you can make a comment uh, on this episode on the man whore podcast Facebook page and ooh guess what guess who's back on Instagram yes I am back 
on the Instagram, I have caved. My morals got soft and weak and very flaccid. And I said, fine, fuck it. I will make a new account. And then all the usernames that were good for branding purposes were taken. Because some uh, piece of shit is squatting on at Billy Presida. That's not me. I am now on Instagram officially at Billy is Presida. And no, I'm not happy about that either. So yeah, Billy is I S Presida, my name. That's me on Instagram. Come follow me. Again, we're giving away a free Mombe blanket at the end of the month uh, to one of my followers over there. And if you want to shoot me an email with your comments, your questions, your booby pictures, you can send that over to manwhorepod at gmail.com. Don't forget, uh, be pledged at $2 or more on my Patreon page on May 1st, and you will receive a honk if you're into consent bumper sticker. Isn't that fun and kitschy? And if you don't want to give me any money, that's okay too, I suppose. But you should still go to patreon.com slash podcast to check out that free bonus episode with Nina Hartley. It's a really good one. You don't want to miss it. Again, head on over to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Podcast. Next week, uh, we're going to have a fabulous comedian, the host of Diking Out, Carolyn Bergier. I think I'm saying that last name right. I'm recording her with her tomorrow, so I will learn if I'm saying the name right or not. Uh, you'll definitely hear it correctly next week. Uh, so until we learn the correct pronunciation of her last name, stay slutty. 